OK, we're now going to look in a bit more detail at some of the, uh, the finite bits of Tiger 1. First thing, starting off on the left there, obviously, then the track guards. Um, the interesting thing about the Tiger 1 was that both the track guards, left and right, actually lifted up. Just gain access there. And also, you note that everything is hinged on the side. The reason being, of course, Tiger 1 had a transit track. Um, so when it was to go on a railway, either because of the, the width of some of the tunnels, you couldn't actually get it on there with the normal track on. So they put a transit track on there and everything then hooked up and the splash guards, etc., were removed to allow it to gain access. Another thing to note on there, you've got an eyelet. Um, the reason for the eyelet was it just means that a lifting frame could be fitted in there. When the lifting frame's in there, there's a hook and weight on the end, and it means that they could assist when they're changing the sprockets on the track. Moving our way across to the right, first we come across, of course, is where the bow gunner stroke the radio operator, as they were one and the same person, actually was positioned inside. Um, you can see on the outside there, the mounting for the MG34. Um, interesting thing obviously about this was the movement wise it had 15 degrees of movement left and right bilaterally and also minus 10 to plus 20 degrees of movement uh, in the vertical. Now obviously Tiger 1, one of the things about Tiger 1 was it was or were capable of doing deep wading. However records show that never actually carried out any deep wading but because of that it made it quite expensive as well and the design process was um, on the outside there is a rim um, and also you can see there's two eyelets there with uh, butterfly screws. Um, when it was preparing for deep wading, it just means that a cover could go on there, obviously to protect the bow mounting gunner there, and also prevent any ingress of water going in. Moving away across the right hand side, we now really come across to the driver's station. Armoured driver's hatch, which could be closed from the inside as well. A couple of interesting points, if you notice on the top there, you've got two weld marks. This was initially where the early version of Tiger 1 would have had the binocular type periscope fitted, but this was replaced um, later on in the design stage. And of course, finally, finishing off really with the other side, um, identical to the left hand side of the track, and again, elevating up or can be moved up as well. OK, moving down the side of the Tiger then, um, you can see more clearly the track configuration. And again, we've got the driver later on to give us a much more detailed thing on there. Um, I already mentioned about the transit tracks. Just a point to note on the transit tracks is when they were fitted, all the outer real road wheels were taken off, obviously, uh, to make it easier to fit. A couple of things to notice on here. Um, on top, you can see we've got a tow rope. Um, and also, although not the original, of course, you'd also have a track rope located on the side here as well. Moving our way back down, you can see very clearly there at the moment, a good position of it is the mantlet, which, um, which actually housed the, obviously the 88mm gun. Interesting point about this is we know this is one of the first 100 production models of this particular mantlet. The reason we know that is because it's got the cutaway portion in this side. Um, the reason being, of course, at one stage, um, when the uh, Porsche thought he was going to actually have the contracts to produce all of the chassis, etc., for the Tiger 1, produce these turrets because the raised engine decks at the rear um, on the Porsche variant meant it would snag unless it had a raised portion on there. So we know by that that this was one of the first 100 production models. Now, of course, the thing that really made the Tiger 1 very distinctive and very impressive on the battlefield was the use of the 88mm. This was based on the um, anti-aircraft gun, the Flax 36, and actually Hitler himself insisted that the Flax 36 was mounted onto a tank chassis. This, of course, caused huge problems because the recoil was absolutely intensive. And what you will find in the Tiger 1 is use of a hydrodynamic buffer and a recuperator, very similar to what you get on modern main battle tanks. And we'll see that a bit later on when we get inside the turret. Again, another thing that made it very distinctive at the time was, of course, the armour protection. The armour protection made it almost, in the initial stages of the war, almost impervious to anything that the Allies could throw against it. And at its thickest part, it is 100 millimetres. It was using rolled homogenous armour. Again, the rolling process actually made it toughened and made it stronger than anything else the Allies had at the time. And another thing, while we're talking about the recoil that's produced by the 88mm, also you find at the end of the barrel there, very distinctive, is the double baffle muzzle brake. The reason for this, of course, actually reduced almost 70% of the recoil that you'd find inside the turret. And actually it was that important that if it was damaged during a conflict or during operations, the crews were told not to fire the main armament. OK, we're now going to start moving up onto the turret. Just a couple of things to point out here. Obviously, the crew positions we're going to have a look at in more detail later on. But as I'm looking down forwards at the tank now, on the right-hand side, you've got where the bow gunner radio operator actually sat. Very simple hatches, um, and he also had his own periscope fitted there as well. Notice the rubber seals you've got all the way around. Working our way across towards where the driver's position is, you've got a jacking block, 
various tall stowage positions, and you've also got a breather there for ventilation. And finishing across the left-hand side there, we've got the driver's hatch. Again, we're gonna have a look at that and get inside in more detail in a bit. But the interesting things to know, and I must admit, I didn't know until we came down here, when you see all the films, um, the photos, etc., of somebody with their head out driving the Tiger, it would have been a physical impossibility. Because as you look down in there, you can see that both the driver and the bow gunner are more positioned centrally towards the um, centre of the tank, so it must have been somebody else sat on the side there, which is quite an interesting point. Look at the side of the turret, we've already explained the trunnions, you can um, also see the trunnions from out there and the mantlet cover. We see the first of our smoke grenade dischargers. Tiger 1 had two banks of smoke grenade dischargers, uh, three on either side of the turret, one mounted left and right, and the controls for this are inside the commander's station, we'll have a look at those in the moment. And also you can see there, we're looking at the right hand side of the turret, you've also got the first of our vision ports there. This would have been the vision port for the loader station, um, and gave him a very, very narrow field of view through there. Okay, we're now moving up on top of the turret and a few things to point out. Um, the first thing I want you to notice there is the emergency or escape hatch, uh, which is located on the rear right hand side of the turret. Incredibly heavy um, and a bit of a design problem there that once it was open, it would just drop away, obviously open from the inside, drop away, but it needed somebody on the outside to actually push it back in position again. Um, and also you see on a lot of records, they actually used that when they were restowing the ammunition on the Tiger One, which is quite a quick way to put ammunition through there uh, and straight into the turret. But we'll look at the turret in a minute. Another couple of things to point out, we've also got the um, armoured cover for the ventilation fan. There's a fan underneath there that provides ventilation for the crew inside. And also, very, very simple design for the loader's hatch. Two positions on the loader's hatch, opened or it could be just left ajar as well to allow some air to come in there. And again, notice quite hefty rubber seals around the hatches. Located on the back of the turret was the only stowage that we can find on Tiger One. Okay, quite a small bin and you'd find in here some of the tools and also some of the crew belongings as well. Um, so you'd find a bin on there. Quite an interesting thing about Tiger 131 was it's actually the original padlocks that came with it, which is obviously very, very unusual. Moving away across, um, we've got a port here. This is a small arms port. And all it meant was obviously the crew had some means there if people mounted the tank, whether it's on the turret or the back decks, they could actually put perhaps one of the small arms, the MP40, through there and fire on them as well okay so just a small port there working our way across and the final thing really we've got located on the turret or the final two things we've got located on the turret we've got another one of our vision slits okay um, you find that the periscope or episcopes located behind there this particular one is where the gunner would sit just behind this wall and finally, the last of our smoke grenade discharges. Okay, looking at the commander's station then, very, very simple conical design. Um, again, with a very simple commander's hatch there with a very heavy duty rubber seal located around the outside. A few of the key things to point out now, you can see there are a number, again, of vision slits behind there are located the periscopes, which you'll see when we get inside the commander's cupola. Um, and also the azimuth indicator located underneath the rim here numbered 1 to 12 all around the outside and all it was was a very simple way that the commander could lay the gunner he's got a similar thing just to the left of him in the gunner station onto a target but again we'll have a look at that in more detail in the gunner station when we get inside there the final thing to know two hollow tubes you can see there they were just the means there used to be a sun shield that could actually go up and protect the crew against the sun